I, I want to first thank our sponsors, which is uh, Pro Photo Daily, American Photography, Epson Photo Shelter, and Archive Magazine. Um, tonight's, you know, I, I think um, Jordan, you guys had uh, Jordan and Anna, you guys had presented once before, right? Yes, we did mm -hmm. like a while back. Yeah, during the lockdowns, I think. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 That's right. In Brooklyn, I, now I remember those images. Yes. Um, so we're we're having um, Anna and Jordan uh, Rathkoff uh, present as well tonight, and we're thrilled about that as um, repeat presenters. And we start off tonight with um, a very dedicated uh, viewer of projections, Howard Paley, and we're thrilled to have him. So Howard, you know, take the screen over, and it's all yours. Great. Um, let me just do a screen share here. And tell me if you see a blank screen on the, yes, on the screen. Yes. Yep. Okay. So what I put together was a PowerPoint. Uh, it's about three minutes long with some music from a friend of mine, a Native American flautist, Travis Terry, um, that'll show a series of 36 images. And, um, and then it'll go to individual frames and we can talk about it. You can ask questions and so forth. Um, my background originally was in forestry and range management at the University of Arizona. Um, I did not pursue that as a career. I, I worked for a couple of years for the Bureau of Land Management, but then I went on and created a, a marketing communications company, and I worked almost exclusively with charities around the United States. I did a little bit of theater work, and um, and that's the short course on my my professional development. So here we go.
Okay, so that's the video. And then how do I then show, because it was in PowerPoint, I don't know how to go about showing the individual. So um, Howard, now uh, you go back to share. Okay. Go and this time share. you go to the regular basic one and you just click on your PowerPoint window like you did last time. We'll go back to my normal. Yep. So let me see. I am to so, basic. Yep. So yeah. yep. Under basic, you'll see one of your screens there, or you can select PowerPoint, mm -hmm. so you only see PowerPoint. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to share that, and let me just go past. There we go. Okay. Okay. Can you see that on the screen? Uh, Howard, do me a favor. Just full screen by hitting the arrows, the the double arrows in the upper right hand side. Um, uh, a little bit to the left, you see the two arrows pointing up bottom left, bottom right, upper right hand side, right by where your mouse is. Move a little bit right higher, hand. a little yep. bit higher. Well, apps more. Right, you see where it says okay. thirty-five percent. There yes, you go. I see that. Okay, and uh, just go. Keep uh, two more. No, no. Keep going. Two icons to the left. You see the two arrows pointing up and down. Um, One more. I don't have I don't have that on my screen. No, I see it right here in mine. I don't have it on mine. Is that okay. it really tiny on your screen? No, it's fine. Okay. That's the full screen have... window. That's why it makes it full screen. And let me see what I have here. This goes here. And then we have an ellipsis here. No. More. I was hoping that this would go a little bit more smoothly. Um, Don't worry, we'll edit this out. Resume the share. Okay, so let us let me just go through what okay. I have. Yeah, you're we'll just fine. Okay, so uh, this image is a, of, of an air motor uh, in Sonoida, Arizona. That's about 40 miles to the southeast of Tucson. Uh, no exceptional story, just to say that it was raining all day long. There was a brief moment when the sky opened up just a little bit for the sun to peer through. It just lit up the foreground. I knew I was golden, stopped the car, actually turned around and went back, took the, took the shot. And within minutes, the clouds had, uh, had turned up and that was the end of it. Uh, so sometimes it's just got to be out in the field and, and, uh, and be willing to stop and, 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 and use your camera. And Howard, how this long is, are you um, living out there, Howard? Excuse me? How, how long, no, no, how long are you living out there? I moved to Arizona in uh, 1975. I transferred from Hofstra University at the University of Arizona, uh, to the University of Arizona. And um, I studied uh, range management and forestry, uh, wildlife biology and watershed management. And, um, and I did that for a, a couple of years working for the Bureau of Land Management, lived in Southern Utah to go work in, in the Northern Canyon lands of Arizona. That's kind of where I learned how to use my camera uh, and how to appreciate the desert landscape that exists out here. Um, I, my approach to my, my photography is to figure out how to capture a scene and to make it and turn it into art, something that somebody wants to own, put on their wall that creates so captures the beauty of the moment. That's what I strive for. The, the, fo the photo that's on your screen at the moment is a place called Manzanita Vista. It's on a mountain range outside of Tucson. Uh, it was late in the afternoon after a rainy day, uh, sun was setting, the mist blew up the canyon. I was driving up to go to a slightly higher elevation, but when I saw this in the, through the front uh, window of the vehicle, I stopped, took the photo and uh, it's called Alabaster Mist is the name of that photo. Um, I love the rock formations. I just love the the, the mystical feel of it. Um, we get a monsoon season in Southern Arizona, uh, like they do in Southeast Asia, from the 15th of June through the 15th of September, and almost every afternoon between 3 and 6 o'clock at night, uh, we will have thunderstorms, massive thunderstorms. And this one's called the anatomy of a storm because it has everything. It has the sunset, it has the bolt, it has the rain that comes down. And if you notice in the bottom right corner, there's a little bit of glow on the ground. Uh, the previous bolt uh, it must have hit a tree and put it on fire. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time. 
no trick to taking lightning photography. If your lens is open, you'll probably get a lightning bolt during the, the storms that we have in Tucson. This is up in Sedona, a um, very famous place. This is uh, the called the West Fork Park. It's a little known park that's about 17 miles of hiking uh, across the West Fork of Oak Creek. And um, at different times of the year, there are different experiences here. The autumn is absolutely glorious, as you can see. The water covers, carves these archways into the, the, the rock formation. And if you get there early enough in the morning, uh, the water's pretty still. Otherwise, the foot traffic that's in that canyon turns the water kind of creamy and muddy. And uh, the quality of the photography is not quite the same. This is also on top of Mount Lemmon, uh, about 9,000 feet above Tucson. Uh, it is the only place here in Southern Arizona where you can get the autumn. Uh, living in a desert biome, we don't normally get to see the turn of, uh, of the trees, but there's sugar maple, uh, aspen, um, uh, beech, uh, and a number of other types of species that will turn color. Uh, this in a little community called Bear Wallow, and uh, it's named appropriately because there are bears that live down in this area. There's a walking path, um, and you're just immersed in color for about three weeks, and then it's gone. This is in a little town called Red Rock that's about 50 miles to the west of Tucson. The mountain range on the horizon is called um, Ragged Top for obvious reasons. This was late in the afternoon. When we get dust in the air, the sun, when it hits it, will just create these amazing chroma. So you can catch various layers of different light, of different color in the mountain ranges. Uh, you just have to be, make sure that you don't overexpose. Everything as I shoot is shot, shot on tripod. This is uh, in a volcanic formation called Cerro Prieto. It, the, the sun spiral that's in the foreground was probably chiseled into that rock about 750 years ago. Um, off in the distance, the mountain range is called Picacho Peak. And I was telling you about the wildflowers when we were first getting ready to do uh, this presentation. These are called bluebells. And I specifically went to be able to shoot petroglyphs surrounded by wildflowers. That was my passion. That's what I was looking for. I got lucky. Early morning, sun was at my back. Um, and I also learned something that I can share with you is, is that when you shoot petroglyphs with the flash, the part of the petroglyph that's carved into the rock will reflect the light. The dark brown of the rock will absorb the light. And so you don't overexpose anything, but you emphasize the actual rock drawings. Almost counterintuitive when you're in full sun. And how, how would, when you go out, do you scout first or, or you, you say today I'm going to leave early and, and I'm going to go to this area and see what you get? I have been to each place that I've shared with you hundreds of times. Um, lots of miles on the car, lots of tires, lots of gasoline, um, lots of wasted uh, days because the weather isn't right, the light isn't right. Uh, but, you know, if you're shooting for lightning, certainly shooting for something like this, the picture that's in front of you here. Uh, you wait for the storms to blow in and then you rush out to places where you've already pre-identified swaros and other types of rock formation um, so that you can capture images. But truly, you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, this was a monsoon storm. This is in the Lower Salt River, which is outside of uh, Phoenix in a town called Mesa. Um, the uh, Little hills that are off to the bottom right are, is a place called Fountain Hills, Arizona, if you're familiar with that. And um, the sun set and blew its rays right through the gaps in the clouds. And I was standing in the right place at the right time, waiting for it to happen. So I may have taken 100 photographs that day to get four or five of them that were in the moment of when we got to see this kind of a glorious thing. So how you really have to keep really tight notes on all your trips in there about timing day, you know, day of the year and all of that, huh? Yes, you do. You have to, and you have, you know, the more familiar you are with the landscape, um, it is, it, when it comes to squirrel cactuses in particular, okay, you, I'm going to go back one image. I, I was raised in New York, so I was raised on Western 
uh, movies. And um, the Squirrels were in the Westerns and I strove to find ones that just reminded me of, you know, have gun will travel and all the John Wayne flicks that I saw and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you will fi I find Squirrels based on their mm -hmm. arms. Um, and then you have to have a certain aspect to them to be able to see all of their arms and you have to know how tall to stand or how low to be to the ground and to be able to be able to put the base or where the arms are coming out of the swarrow above the horizon. So there's a method. There's definitely a method. This is uh, looking at Ragged Top Mountain, this mountain range that's, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, the yeah. mountain range off in the top right um, it was the same mountain that was in a previous photo. This is from the top of Picacho Peak, so I'm standing at approximately 4,500 feet and a dust storm blew in below where I was standing. Had no idea that there was gonna be a dust storm, but I knew from that vantage point, which is uh, quite a climb, you have to really wanna to go to the top of this thing because you're going from the desert floor from about 1,700 feet to 4,000 feet. So it's it's quite a, quite a tour. And I got very, very lucky. I was blessed to have this moment uh, right camera, right time, um, took the image. Uh, what you don't know about this photograph is that it was shot with an old Nikon D70S and the it didn't have an automatic lens cleaning function built into the sensor. Uh, so I had to spend a lot of time getting rid of a lot of speckles on the, on the original image. But uh, I love it. Mm. Uh, this is um, in the bottom, you see that little thimble sticking up that's thimble point this was just one of those moments i turned to my wife who was sitting in the house and i said bobby i think the sunset is going to be absolutely incredible we have to get to the top of this mountain so within about 25 minutes we hit this vantage point to witness this most amazing uh cloud formation and um those are the kinds of things that i wait to see, you know, th that i watch the sky for this is also from Mount Lemmon. So the images that you see in the to the left, those are called hoodoos, H-O-O-D-O-O. -O -O. Uh, it's a rock formation that you find in many different places, but you also find them on the top of this mountain. And we're looking at about five different mountain ranges looking directly south towards Mexico. This was late in the afternoon, just before sunset. And um, there was a lot of particulate in the air. You can see in the foreground that there's some white stuff. It was actual snow on the ground, which is why everything came out with blue hues. It was just a very, very cold day. And um, I was lucky. Wait a second, Howard. You yeah. really have to stop saying you were lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're busting your balls. You're going up hills. You're going up mountains. You're jumping in cars. You're doing all that stuff. It ain't luck. You're gonna you're gonna tell that's some true. young person here. It's all about luck. You got to Yes. And I've never confronted a photographer <laughs> ever on projections until this very moment. You're not. Howard, like, the shot doesn't frame itself. Yes. <laughs> Say that. Anyway, okay. I will. I will. I'll erase a race. This was a beautiful scene, and I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time, and I knew to be there. So that was part of the thing. Okay. Uh, Mount Lemmon is you'll see it pervasive in this in this show, uh, but uh, this is uh, on the highway, almost just above city level, and uh, where the sun is actually setting in is the Tucson Mountain Range, and you're able to place the Suaro Cactus right into silhouette, which is why I stood in, in in this particular location. Again, waiting for weather making the rush up the mountain 17, 18 miles from my front door at that time where I was living. Uh, and um, fortunately, uh, we got the reds, which I love to shoot for red. And this is way north. This is a place called Pete Seal. Pete Seal in Navajo means broken pottery. Uh, what you, you can't see, but you might be able to get some sense of it is the entire walkway that's in the foreground here is all littered with broken pieces of shards of pottery. Uh, this is six miles up a wet canyon. You're only allowed to stay a day. You're met by a guide, a Navajo guide, who will lead you into this ruin. It's called the Eye of the Anastasi. And uh, you can spend the entire day there photographing it. Um, to give you some sense of how remote it is, it has matatis, which are the grinding 
bowls that the Native American peoples used to grind corn and other things uh, to feed their village. And there were still corn cobs in the toddies. So that, and this was built seven, 800 years ago. One of the best preserved uh, ruins um, in Navajo National Monument in Northern Arizona. And I'm in love with this stuff. So I, uh, I will chase up Canyon. And for me, it's a, it's a question of determining how much camera equipment, how much water and food. Uh, and this, this was not an easy canyon. It was a wet canyon and there was quicksand and all kinds of interesting things that you had to navigate through to get to this spot. This was back down in the Tucson area. This is a place called Agua Caliente. I included it in the show because I wanted you to know that water is life and uh, it's golden here in Arizona. What you're seeing in front of you doesn't exist anymore. There was a fire that swept through here, burned all the, all the brush out of it. All of the palm trees are now charred. Um, they had to drain it, reseal the, the area and then wait for the rains to come, which it did this year. And so for the first time in about seven years, there's now water back in the spot, but none of the reeds, they're all gone. Filled with herons, uh, filled with um, uh, uh, turtles, um, cormorants, um, all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of birds, a fabulous place to photograph. Egrets, white egrets, phenomenal. This is also taken from Mount Lemon Highway. I'll, I'll go through this one real quickly to, to give you some idea. The swirls sit on a canyon wall about three football fields from the road across a deep canyon that goes down about 60 feet. And uh, the moon will rise up through the swirls. And then you can walk up the road 25 yards and set it behind the cliff and shoot it again. And then walk another 25 yards and shoot the moon rise again. And so for about an hour, you can shoot the moon rising through swaro, rising through mesquite trees, rising through ocotillo plants. That was something I discovered early on and um, I've taken a lot of people here and uh, and shown them how to shoot the moon. The fun part is, is, is that the swaros on a 300 millimeter lens um, are at uh, infinity. So that's why the moon is sharp and the swaros are sharp. So do you do tours, Howard? Excuse, yes, I do. Yes, I you do. do. I have okay. a company called Southwest Photo Safari that I take people out. Yeah, you put to, a, yeah, you have to put that in the chat room so people I will do that. I will do that. Um, this is Aravipa Canyon. To give you some idea how remote this is, um, it's 15 miles long. Uh, there's the western end of it. They only allow 24 people in a day. Um, and it's a wet canyon. So you're walking in water all day long. You'll notice in the foreground all the yellow. Um, that is, um, and some red, there are penstemons, there's poppies, and I hit it kind of two, three o'clock in the afternoon, and you can see the halo of all the needles on the swirl get lit up by the sun. And I live for that moment, and when it happens, you're golden. And um, was with a group of about four other people, two of them were my boys, and um, we had a, an incredible experience there. This is Chiricahua National Monument. This is about 120 miles from Tucson. Um, it is a, a desiccated cauldron, a volcanic cauldron. The towers that you see in the center and across the ravine, across the canyon itself, are rhyolite uh, boulders. So as the water and wind uh, erode away the, uh, the, the rock, you end up with these incredible towers and balanced stones and stuff. This was also during the monsoon season. This is the canyon that I lost my first Nikon D90. I got caught in a hailstorm, a rainstorm, and my Parker, a little you know, plastic Parker, $1.59 Parker, was sitting in the truck because I didn't think I was going to need it. And uh, I couldn't have been wetter had I been swimming. The camera got absolutely flooded with water. This was literally the last photograph I took with that camera. Never, never worked well again, even after I sent it back to Nikon. So you live and you learn. Yeah, it, it's amazing um, that all this imagery is all in Arizona. It's all all Arizona, and most of it's southern Arizona, which is what I thought I would do because many of you may not have been here, and you just people don't quite understand the the allure. And hopefully, I'll that I'll, I'll leave you with that and, and wanting to see more. Um, this is the same can in, and the same swirl that I shot that moonrise over, except this is at dawn. 
So you can go back to the same spots over and over again at different times of day, different atmospheric moments, and, um, and get completely different photographs. And so again, you watch the weather. Um, if there are wildflowers, fires burning in, uh, and you get all the smoke, you'll get a completely different color, colorization of your landscape. And so you wait and you watch for those moments. Yeah. Uh, this is another Hohokam petroglyph. This is called Signal Hill. It's in a park called Suaro National Monument on the other side of the Tucson Mountains, which is in the backdrop that you see there. Um, it is also about 700, between 700 and 800 years old. It was used by the Hohokam uh, civilization uh, to monitor herd movement. And been a lot of stories written about it. And the tops of, the, uh, of this stone that it was carved in were carved in such a way to mirror the actual peaks. And that's the way they lined it up and put sticks on it and figured out what time of year they were at. Okay. Fascinating place. There's about a hundred petroglyphs on this particular site. It's, it's uh, less than a football field from the parking area. There's no effort to get to it, but you have to know where it is. This is also further north. This is Monument Valley. Um, and I, I put it in because if you've, been there, then you know just how magical it is. And if you've been there at dawn, it's even more so. Uh, it, it, depending on, again, atmospheric moments, uh, you will get all kinds of dust and stuff that the sun uh, likes to pick up. And you end up with all that layering that you see to the left of the photograph. I love silhouettes. The mitten at, uh, at Monument Valley is ideal for that kind of shot. So uh, from an artistic standpoint, it just rocks. <laughs> to be punny. Um, this is uh, uh, what's called a mold copy on um, formation. So there's lots of dinosaur fossils here. This is outside of Winslow uh, to the east of it. And you literally get this sense that the earth is melting in on itself. And in fact, it is because when it rains, it gets smaller and smaller and the valleys get deeper and deeper. It's a very, very, very soft stone right off the side of the highway. And um, I love the patterns in it. So I also shoot, you'll see in my work, I like to shoot for patterns, re repetition of pattern. Um, in Aravipa Canyon that I spoke to you about earlier, we had, uh, there's a bighorn sheep population. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, this fella came down, took a look at me, turned his head, snapped the photo. Probably have about 15, 20 images of him and several others, but he had the horns, he had that neck formation. You get the sense of the strength of this animal. Um, and that's what I liked about this photo. This is again up in Sedona. This is uh, probably one of the most photographed rock structures there. This Cathedral Rock in Red Rock Park. Um, came late in the afternoon, the sun is behind me and you can see the reflection of the spire in the water. Water gets really, really flat. And this time of year, it's uh, very navigable. You can walk the entire uh, creek bed. Uh, right now it's flooded. You couldn't get in here if you tried. The autumn comes very, very late here. Um, so this was, I don't recall exactly, but I think this was probably shot in, um, in January. This is Sabino Canyon, which is a very famous park in Tucson. Um, this is called uh, prime time because it was the prime time to shoot photographs with the sun setting, lighting up all the Suaro cactus, the spire on the, uh, on the um, horizon is called Cathedral Rock. And um, my wife and I lived close enough that we used to hike this two or three times a week. And after you do that, you become familiar with different place, places to be and different times to, to times of day to be there. And uh, we, we were golden this day. This is also back up in Sedona and just a word about converting from color to black and white. Um, sometimes the color doesn't give you the drama that is inherent in a scene. And typically for me, it comes when you get a cloud formations like this one. Um, by the end of the day, it was raining. Uh, and the clouds blew in these little tufts. There's some really wonderful Western uh, uh, painters who specialize in trying to capture these cloud formations. Maynard Dixon is one that comes to mind. Uh, Ed Mel is another one that comes to mind. And um, when I stand in these places and see these things, I think of them. 
This is um, Thimble Point. You, I pointed out Thimble in an earlier photograph to you. When sometimes we get storms and they blow in at around 2,400 feet. So if you get up above it around 6,000 feet, 7,000 feet, which is where I'm standing, all you see are the spires from the mountain range and the on the tops of the clouds. Stemble Point. This is also from Mount Lemon Highway, roughly was at the time it was about 25 miles from my front door. This is Grand Canyon, famous place, sunset, uh, Hopi Point. You can see the Colorado River down there on the bottom left. Um, again, it was a function of knowing where to be, uh, being able to see the weave of the canyon, uh, setting the camera up so that uh, I didn't overexpose the uh, what was happening in the cloud formation, hoping that I could catch the sun come through. But it turned out it was after the sun went down that there was enough contrast in the foreground to be able to pick up some of the definition in the canyon. And again, it was a golden moment. In the Lower Salt River outside of um, uh, Phoenix, in Mesa, Arizona, Suaro Lake uh, is part of the Salt River Project's reservoir for generating electricity for the city and for ir providing irrigation water for that valley, is a herd of wild horses. And they're protected forever. Um, I, I did a Ukrainian fundraiser, it was an art auction, and as soon as the auction was over, I rushed to the bottom of the canyon because I knew where I could find my friends. And um, there was this grouping of four, it's a family, and I shot for about an hour. Uh, and they, when that one uh, mare on the far end put her head down to the water, I said, oh my God, I'm ready. <laughs> That's the moment, and that was the moment. And also, all of their heads lit up so you could see all the horse's eyes. Yeah, You just kind of get a sense of the tranquility of the moment. I call this photograph soft space. And how? what's the determining factor for you, color versus black and white? So sometimes color doesn't, um, it takes away from the image to me. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's, um, I, don't, I really don't know how to explain it. It's, uh, I think that the the drama of fo some photography comes from black and white, being uh, of, of not stimulating your your brain, if you will, or distracting it with a color. And so sometimes by removing color, I think you end up with a stronger image. That's, that's the only way I know how to describe it. Um, so sometimes I use it and sometimes I don't. There's just a few more and then and then uh, uh, I'll be I'll be done here. Spider Rock is in a place called Canyon de Shea. That's in Northern Arizona. Um, I took a gentleman by the name of Irving Olson with me. He was 99 years old, uh, hired a guide. Uh, and um, they loved Irving because Irving was old and healthy. He died when he was 103 years old, wow. lucid to his dying day. And uh, I ended up, I bought his camera from his sister because it was the way that I wanted to remember him. And I took him to this place called Spider Rock at sunrise. Uh, it's just this remnant uh, canyon wall standing all by itself. It's a, it's a mystical place for the, the Navajos. I don't know the full story, but uh, you can probably find it on Ryan, online. Spider Rock, fabulous, fabulous place. The very little white caps on the top of that stone is probably the reason why it's still standing. That's Kaibab limestone, which is what it is not water soluble. And eventually when that cap disappears, that whole column will come down. So here's an example of conversion to black and white. So this is during the wildflower season. The foreground was filled with these tiny little yellow flowers. And I said, oh my God, I'm great. I'm in the right place at the right time. The clouds are there, birth perfect. But the flowers were so tiny that it didn't have the drama that I was feeling until I converted the image to black and white. Um, I, can, I refer to the swirl cactus as desert corduroy uh, for, for obvious reasons. It reminds me of corduroy shirts and corduroy pants and stuff. The rock formation in the background is very stoic. It's almost like uh, Land of the Lost, which is what draws me to this particular area. And again, I mark various swirls for different reasons because I know because they, they create a scene. And so part of setting up your camera is knowing that you have the right composition and then um, 
hoping that you have your cloud formations or that something magical is happening, whether there's a bird swooping by, sometimes there's eagles and things like that, hawks and stuff. And then in this particular case, the drama of the image came when I took the color out. Um, I wanted to show you this image because we get sunsets like this all the time in Tucson, Arizona. This is from Sabino Canyon. We had the sawtooth pattern on the uh, Catalina Mountains. And what you'd see on the top of the saguaro cactus is all this little frenulated stuff that gives you a sense of what time of year it was. This is when the saguaros go to bloom. They have these beautiful white flowers. It's the state flower of Arizona. And um, this photograph captures all of that in a single image. It gives you the season, it gives you the canyon, it gives you the brilliance of the sunset all at once. This was probably the earliest image I've ever taken. My oldest son was probably seven. He's now 45. Um, I brought him in, he was on my shoulders. I carried my camera and tripod in with me. This was a small little stream in Pima Canyon, one of the tributaries into the, the center of the Tucson Valley. Um, and um, this image is absolutely stunning, blown up. It was shoot with, shot with a Fuji 100 and a Nikon uh, F5 camera. I still have the camera. This is also shot from Hopi Point. Um, this is. One of the lessons that you learn uh, is that always turn around. The sunset was glorious, but the beauty of the Grand Canyon was the reflection of light that you get at sunset and the color that it brings out in the canyon. And so when you turn around, uh, you will also find magic. Lots of depth in this. This is back in Canyon de Chez. I just want to show you this. The two fellows that I brought with me, Irving Olson being 99 and Bill George, who was with me, another photographer friend, um, they couldn't make it to this spot. And I saw the window and the, and the guide stopped and uh, let me climb all the way up to it. It was probably about half a mile to get to this opening. Uh, set it up, clouds rolled past the, the eye of the, of, of the window took the photograph, came back with a smile on my face. Just a real brilliant spot to be. And, you know, the wind is howling fabulous. This is on the top of Mount Graham. This is outside of a town called Safford. This is at 10,000 feet. So this happens, this is an aspen forest. These plants are all part of one, these trees are all part of one organism. Um, and uh, during the wintertime, they can get up to 126 feet of snow on this mountain. And so the bowing and the uh, uh, the bending of the of of the uh, of the trees themselves occurs when the snow gets that heavy, and then um, you have autumn for about a week, sometimes less, because the winds will come in here at the in November, um, and strip the leaves off the trees, throw them on the ground. Autumn is over. Yellow is gone. Wow. And this is this is the last photo in my series. This is down in Yuma, Arizona. So this is. Um, the 280 miles from how from home for me. Um, this was after a rainstorm on our way to San Diego. Uh, we stayed in Yuma overnight to split the trip in half. Um, my wife is not as early as riser as I am, so I ran out to the Imperial Sand Dunes, uh, walked out onto the dunes after the rain, which I knew I was going to be golden because there weren't going to be any tire tracks, there weren't going to be any footprints, um, and I was right. And uh, this was a brown scene, very pretty, early morning, I would say probably 5.30 in the morning. Um, but the light was just so amazing. When I took the color of the sand out of it, it really allowed you to see all the ridge lines. It almost sounds like um, in, the, in the book, the Heinlein's book, Dune, when you were thumping to bring the sandworms out, that's what kind of came to mind for me, was that the ground would literally shake and you would get this vibrational pattern. And um, uh, and even in Lawrence of Olivier, when he sunk into the quicksand, it's that whole sense that you get. You get the sense of infinite, the sense of um, of, uh, of timeliness, of timelessness. And so for me, most of my photography is tied up in being able to acquire that sensation and then capture it and share it with you. Absolutely beautiful, Howard. 
Really, really. Gonna stop. I'm gonna stop the share. There we go. Yes, Howard. Um, when you're done, make sure you put in the chat room your website, your um, your tour company, all of that, and people can buy prints from you as well. Yes, they can. Um, I have. I took all the images that were in this particular show, and uh, put it up uh, on uh, SmugMug on uh, hpaley.com. And uh, you can find those images there, and you certainly can find me on Facebook. And I apologize to the others, to to Anna, uh, for going over. No, no, but, uh, no, it's absolutely fine. And you are now, and I'm, I'll, um, uh, for the younger people who won't know, you are now forever the Lou Gehrig of photography. And if, 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 if you have to, if you don't know what that is, you have to do research. And it's I'm going to need some context. Yes, well, everyone. He's a he was a great Yankee. I'll leave it at that. Um, but Howard, that was absolutely terrific. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. It's like I said, we said it was a long time coming to have you. So um, that was really wonderful. So next up, we have Anna and Jordan Lafkoff, and I let you guys share your screen, and here we go. Well, thank you for having us, Howard. The photography was absolutely stunning. Thank you. We love hiking, so it was it was incredible. Yeah, that's yeah. We gotta go. You're gonna have to take us on one of your tours. Yes. Man. Okay. <laughs> You're delighted. So we wanted to share with you um, our project. Uh, this is um, it starts with me. Um, seven years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, we had a uh, two and a half year old Jesse, our son, uh, and it was very unexpected to be diagnosed uh, in a youngish age of uh, just 37. Um, and we started to photograph each other and our life, uh, what we did. Um, yeah, it was uh, part, partially it was a, like a therapy. And uh, partially it was just uh, uh, getting a perspective, getting uh, ourselves out there. Um, this whole series, we thought we are basically done. And then uh, was it two years ago? My mom was diagnosed with cancer again hmm. uh, and uh, with a stroke. So we realized that um, it's just one big project. Um, and it's basically about uh, a sandwich generation. Because when I was sick, my mom came from Czech Republic to help us. She lived with us for a, about a year, right? And uh, she was with us all the time, taking care of me. Uh, and then uh, it changed. I don't know if you see the, the full image without the, the bar. You have to move it down. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's cool. Oh, okay. Oh, amazing. Yeah, we, we see it. Uh, so we started to, um, we went again into uh, our survival mode and um, it just started to be a little bit different. Uh, I, as a diagnosed before, suddenly started to feel and document the experience from the, the person uh, that needed help. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um... It was unusual to have two photographers in a relationship going through this because I think oftentimes what you'll see is like the perspective of maybe the partner documenting their partner going through something or maybe a child with their with their parent. I think what was kind of interesting to me working on this project with Ani was that she was coming at it with her own perspective as someone going through it rather than just kind of this helpless person just sitting there. Yeah being documented as they're, you know, dealing with a health you know, crisis, she had her own things she was going through. And it was, it was, you know, we weren't really looking at these images together until maybe a year or two after her diagnosis. We basically just uh, putting the images and dumping them in the computer. And uh, we didn't have the capacity of talking about it. But it was interesting. It was that it opened up once we went through it with a step back, a little bit time passing, we started to open up to each other. And it was uh, 
giving us opening full conversation about how we both felt, even though we were together all the time. I mean, Jordan was with me on every doctor's appointment, uh, but we still felt that we were very lonely. So it felt like you can hold somebody's hand and be alone. And at, at any point, were any were you directing him to take this photograph this way, or we should photograph this? You know, how did that play out for both of you? Uh, well, a lot of photos that I took, uh, I I was reflecting what I saw around me, and at that time I was uh, just my body was very limited because I was in chemo and uh, all the treatment. Uh, and I just felt like an observer of the life around me. And uh, yes, sometimes we, I just felt like-, like this, picture, this picture, for instance, like she was terrified about losing her hair, which was kind of interesting because Anna's never been particularly vain when it comes to hair or anything. But she, for some reason, um, that was really triggering for her. And so she, she decided she wanted to just kind of shave her hair and have her mom do it. And I, th I think what's kind of interesting in the project a little bit, at least for us, but I think can be kind of universal is that, you know, her mother and not her were not, you know, they were close and they love each other, but they had problems. Yeah. And something about when her mother had to come take care of Anna and help us, it healed a little bit of some mm -hmm. of the issues that they had had. But when later on, you'll see when her mother got sick and Anna had to switch and take it, care. It, we didn't, it was, uh, it, it was a little diff it was a difficult. Different, yeah, it was a different kind of situation in which kind of that closeness that they developed when Anna was sick. I think they actually became a little more distant when Anna's mother became sick. So like this kind of image, this tenderness with the mother and the daughter, I think you'll see later on when we show some yeah. images later on, there's a different kind of vibe going on. We also yeah. found yeah sorry no no no. i i was wondering you know like a moment like that you know the mom is, is cut you know is is cutting your hair i mean can you can you shed you know what that was for your mom that has to be an incredibly painful moment um well it's kind of i wanted to say it's funny because my mom was always cutting my hair growing up she's very <laughs> handy uh Yes, and she actually used to, I used to wear uh, very short hair oh. as a teenager. I was like into Shinnett O'Connor, so yeah, yeah. it wasn't so uh, so painful, but um, uh, there, there were moments where I could see, again, like through the photographs, because when you're in the scene, you just don't, don't see it. But then uh, through the photos, I noticed uh, um, how difficult it was for her. Mm. And uh, I can only imagine, I hope I will never have to th go through something like that with uh, what my mom did with me. Because Cause, cause that, that has to be sort of a flashback. Yes. For her, right? Yes. There's the teenage girl, there's my little... Exactly. There, there's, there's, my, there's my little angel, and now I'm doing it at 37. <laughs> I don't know if my mom ever called me her okay. angel. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting... Okay. Uh, Ani and her mom, they always have had a very interesting relationship in that, you know, mother and daughter, but they were really kind of like friends. Mm. Um, you know, Anna's mother grew up in, in communist Czechoslovakia. Um, she was, had a very tough life. She kind of was in an orphanage herself or like a foster. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was a, a boarding school. A boarding school, but her parents didn't really live with her. And so she was a very independent minded person. And she kind of raised her kids that way, where it was the kind of a relationship where like they were more friends in some ways than a traditional mother daughter. So when she actually had to come take care of Anna, it was actually some of the most traditional like parenting her yeah. mother had had to do in a very long time. Yeah. Um, and that was that was a little weird for them, I think, observing it. But like I said, you could see it actually brought them close in a way that they hadn't been as a mother daughter in a very long time. Yeah, maybe I felt um, at that time, I felt like it's my mom and not my friend. Mm. And uh, I felt like finally uh, she's there for me. Only, you know, the selfish child inside of me uh, felt that way. And so, you know, I think for me as being part of the project with Anna and mom and everything, like um, what was interesting to me when we kind of recouped and we looked at images together was how much Anna was focusing on her body and her appearance. And 
that was something that I wasn't really aware of in the same way, meaning that a lot of the project for her was kind of about the pressures put on her as a woman to appear a certain way and to feel a certain way and to be a certain way. And that's not, that's an underlying project, uh, underlying feeling throughout the whole thing, even uh, as we are approaching my mom, the, the body image of we as women also have, and it has nothing to do with uh, per se uh, a cancer, but I just feel it. I don't know. I It's not one of these images, but um, as we were going through the images, uh, there was one when I was in, uh, chemo i looked very sick but my first uh, flash was oh my god i look so good i'm so thin and then i realized how bad that actually is how warped the idea of of your own body image is and, and i leave in this image so we took this she was really down on this this day it was a really tough week for her and maybe a day before her she had a different job at that time. She worked in an office for a real government job. And uh, they pulled her in. And the first thing they said to her is, you look so beautiful, but your, your focus isn't very good. And, you know, this is while she's in chemo. And so that was kind of like, again, reinforcing this idea for her that, like, how she looked was so important. Like, even yeah. to her employers, like, they were judging what she was going through to some degree on... How the I fact look. that she had makeup on and that she wasn't just showing up like completely untended. So w w when you guys come to that thought, that's a pretty intense thought that you're feeling this way because you're thin. I mean, like that revelation has got to stop you right in your tracks. Yes, it did. I mean, uh, well, Jordan gave me a look. He opened his mouth and he gave me a look. So I realized that and as you sometimes when you say things you're realizing what a nonsense you're saying the problem is that uh i really felt it i still look at the image and i'm thinking not bad well she, she's Except, also she's on tamoxifen which yeah. is a drug. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They, they give tamoxifen it's a drug that kind of induces uh menopause yeah and so it makes you gain weight actually so i think she actually was looking at that image because she feels like you know the tamoxifen is impacting her ability to stay slim and stay thin um it's it's very interesting when you're thinking about it um on that way but it's also interesting to see how um uh horrible i felt inside mm. inside i felt and i still struggle with that i felt so betrayed by my own body i felt like my body just gave up on me and uh i was supposed to be there with my you know like i had baby kind of three year old and uh but, but, yeah th th I, that's sort of interesting how, how you have two different headsets you yes. think this way then you go this way then you go this way and each one of those thoughts are are compelling and deep have deep meanings and deep repercussions right i mean yeah. to find yourself thinking in places that are totally new yeah i completely you just and that's what i love in photography i love that it gives us that that possibility of stepping out mm. and seeing and feeling again and uh, that's um that was one of the observing pictures that I took when I, I just saw Jordan and Jesse and uh, I saw so much love and um, I so wanted to be part of it. And yet I felt so far away. And uh, like after when we were talking, I had no idea how much Jordan was struggling with his uh, <laughs> feelings of masculinity and uh, his feelings of he needs to be the, the rock he cannot cry in front of me because I'm going through horrible things. And it was kind of sad. Um, I think maybe we were like crying together. Him because he was so scared, but he couldn't get the feelings out. I don't know. I don't want to talk for you. but Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's the other part of the project for us that's become very important um, and has emerged, which is that it creates conversations around, I think, you know, anyone who's been in a situation where they've had to take care knows how hard that is um, for a lot of reasons. Um, but I found for myself as a man, I was shocked how hard it was to find support for myself emotionally. 
Um, I went to social workers at hospitals. I tried finding people I could talk to. I even have friends whose wives had breast cancer. Just no one wanted to talk about the fear of like uh, what they were going through. And like, for me, unfortunately, I couldn't get away from, like, I'm just always been kind of sensitive and willing to be vulnerable. And I, in this period of time, I don't know if I ever felt so alone. Um, Cause Anna has been my rock for 20 years and now she was out of commission, maybe potentially dying for all we knew. And I was really losing it. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, uh, this is, um, that's one of the, the moments when I had with my mom, uh, when she was uh, with us helping me. Uh, I always had this uh, uh, dislike to the images of um, uh, the sick person being kissed on the head. I always felt it was uh, strange. So, but I see on my mom's again, like how much uh, it was uh, influencing her as a mother to see her, her daughter sick and not well. Yeah, and then, you know, unfortunately, her mother, you know, she's, she was living with us and, you know, she woke up one morning and she didn't feel like half of her body. And she was sure it was a pinched nerve because it's happened before. And like three days later, our son came to us and he's like, you know, grandma's not moving well. She, and like, we were, that's when it kind of occurred to us, wow, maybe she really needs to go to the hospital. And we took her in it. It turned out she had a stroke. While she was there, they actually discovered she also had cancer. The cancer actually may have triggered the stroke. Yeah. Um, Does she speak English? No. 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 So okay. that, was, that was another um, part. Jesus. And then, then it started, our uh, relationship was, uh, was changing. Um, we were switching roles. Now I'm, my mom was completely dependent on me. Um, she was, sometimes I felt like I have another child. It, that's how it felt to have a, another child instead of mother that was here for me. I had to be there for her on uh, every detail. And our relationship unfortunately started to deteriorate. Um, our issues that we had before came flaring up. Uh, so we were photographing. Yeah, her mom did not take well to being taken care of. And, and Anna, where where are you now as far as your progression with well, your with your sickness when um, your mom I'm, has I'm, this stroke? I'm six years out. Um, I am uh, in remission. No, no, I'm saying at the moment that your mom gets the oh, stroke. Oh, yeah, that was uh, I was like four years out. Four years out. Okay. Yes, I was four years out, so I was in remission. Um, and it was, uh, I realized one thing that, uh, uh, with the trauma, your time and the, the perception of time just warps. It's not linear anymore. It's not like, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, the time is all over. Sometimes mm -hmm. I felt like I'm the person laying down in the hospital. And, uh, sometimes I felt like I am the sick one. The, the memory is just kept flashing back and forth. Like this image, for instance, we were, thought it was after her sickness. And, and yeah. then we looked and it was like two years before something. It's like, mm. it, but this is how we imagined her. And this is how, you know, and that's kind of what's, I think, interesting with photography sometimes. And like the, like, and even with our own project, it's like they become this stamp. And like this time stamp. And in a weird way, it can reframe how you actually remember things happening or, or your recollection in some ways of how things were. And so like even moments like this that we were so sure was like the recovery and her and her good mood, it wasn't, but that's how we remembered it. And it was interesting how sometimes photos like, cause this is shot in such a documentary way and not everything we do is shot documentary, but this is shot very <clears throat> documentary, but it's interesting cause it's not always, what, what does that mean, right? Like, you know, it is still interpretation. It's still um, influenced by, by other factors. But it, it feels like a, a proof of uh, what happened is true and how we felt at that time. But again, I... Like uh, this, is, this was actually her soon after her recovery as opposed to what we thought was her. Yeah. So you can see the stark difference between 
sometimes what you imagine and what is. Yeah. And, and how long did your mom live with you? Um, at that two years. Well, she's yeah, she lived with us on and off for about six because of Ani's treatment. You know, went on and yeah. so on and off for about six Co because of COVID. She actually she wasn't with us right when COVID started, and she was supposed to come, and then she couldn't because of COVID. So she was for maybe she, 20 most of 2020 not with us but she was supposed to be she came in august 2020 and then the august 2021 she got sick um and again uh it was it was tough on our relationship but uh i am actually very happy we were able to do this uh photo series because it did gave me the the breather and the the feelings that i needed to get the empathy uh, and just seeing what my mom went through is basically what I went through and how hard it is to ask for help, how hard it is to uh, be the helpless and how hard it is to uh, have your body limiting you. And, and when you, Annie, when you say you needed that, can, I, can, you, can, can you speak to that? Does that relate to you as a daughter and a mom? You know, what, what, what piece of that are you speaking about? I think it, uh, it speaks for me as a daughter because uh, when my mom got sick and all our issues came like blowing up, mm. our long-term issues, um, I was angry. I felt resentful. I was scared. I was really scared. But I felt like my capacity for full empathy was not there because I was so terrified that I might lose her, that I mm. also lost that most important feeling of, I just want you here. I was just covered in fear. And uh, thanks to this, uh, seeing the images and working with them, I started to feel that love and the empathy and realized that a lot of the anger was because of the, was because of the fear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how time, like, uh, you know, at the time this was so difficult for us, and now I'm looking back on it, it's just like, um, it's just amazing. Like, I see her mother in such a different way now, too. Looking like as time has passed, because at the time she was being really difficult to be quite quite honest with everyone. I mean, like, she was a difficult patient. Yes. Yes, she was not. She was not playing nice. Like she was angry at us all the time for helping her. Um, she wanted to act like it wasn't happening. She wasn't limited. She wasn't, you know, she was in some ways in denial. So, you know, we were having to be bad cops, but in a, a different way, as we've looked at it later on in time, it's just unbelievable how much she's gone through and already in her life and what she just overcame. And like, you know, it made us feel so much more empathy and love to look back at these things. You know, we, we hadn't looked at the photos for about a year. Um, so do you think it had to do with her not wanting to be neat, her not wanting to need anyone else's help based yes. on based on her own yes. upbringing and being dynamic and living in the Czech, you know, living in Czechoslovakia at that time, it had to be a hard life. And now I have to be taken care of. She wanted no part of that. Definitely it was that part. And it was again, uh, thanks to me being diagnosed before um it's that feeling of uh you hate being helpless mm. as a person you just don't like it you, it's uh it's really hard to ask for help yeah. and Especially it's really hard yeah. and it's really hard to open up and uh admit you're scared and i know she was terrified and i was terrified I was terrified. She was scared for losing me. She was scared for losing her own life. But I, I was terrified too. I was terrified I will lose my mom. Mm. And uh, uh, fear is not the best emotion. And uh, I am very happy that we have. I, I love photography as a medium. I love it because it, it gives me the uh, possibility of seeing and feeling what other people can feel and see. And how is she doing now? Uh, she's in Czech and uh, she's much better. 
Um, she always has some issues still. She luckily, but we didn't know. We had to, again, you have to learn so much, right? So we didn't know that uh, with stroke, if you are lucky enough and you get in hospital within two to four hour window, they can reverse it. Yes, that's no matter it. how difficult that is. But yeah. then the doctors tell you, well, most of the strokes happen during the night. So you won't be able to do it anyway. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I think that we learned a lot through our two experiences with Anna and her mom. I think photographically, our approach was really about showing it in a very real way. It's not always easy to look at. Um, but that was partly because we just felt like when she first got sick, just none of it felt relatable, what we were seeing online, or you would just find the most tragic, horrible story where someone dies and like, you know, it's just so depressing. So it's like, we wanted to find like something a little bit in the middle of those extremes of like the super depressing and the super fake, just kind of what it feels like to really be going through this. And I think what's interesting to us is that because of COVID, a lot more people now can relate to some of these issues mm. um, because it's Absolutely. not specific to cancer or to strokes. Um, now, so many people have been impacted in so many ways by this that I think that there's more of a um, more of an audience that is looking for stories that receptive as well. Kind yeah. of find a balance between the tragic and the beautiful because it's really not so clear cut and sometimes a really tragically sad moment is also incredibly beautiful and it's it's weird it's just not so black and white sometimes yeah which, which is sort of interesting how you know this this complete story takes you mentally to different places that you right. normally wouldn't get to and a lot of times in a whole lifetime you don't sure. get to these places where you've been taken mentally you know, based on the circumstances. So, you know, was it automatic when each of you got sick that you would you would use your camera? It wasn't like a discussion. It was just, this is what we do. It, it's sort of like second nature. We, we, we're going to document this. It was, uh, I think it was uh, a survival mode. Mm. Because we have the option of uh, create, I think creativity as a as as a one thing can help people. It's proven, right? It's helping people right, through like the hardest times, and uh, we just happen to have the camera as a part of the creative uh, a process, and uh, I think it was very much instinctive at the beginning. Yeah. And then uh, we realized uh, it's just so unbelievable what you're going through. It's just re you don't I don't know. It's like it's and no one we knew could relate. I, you know, especially at our age, none of our friends had cancer. Um, most of them didn't even have kids. So it's like, you know, it was just this kind of like scenario where it's like it almost felt surreal. It was like, okay. is this really happening? Like, are we really is this what's going on? And so I think the camera in a, in a great way. Yeah. Gave some reality to what we were going through. Cause like, I don't know without that camera, if, if our family and friends would have really understood what that experience had been like for us. And then through sharing it though, what we realized was how many people actually could relate. And that was what was kind of endearing to us and like made it feel kind of worth it beyond just our personal need to do it was mm -hmm. that we saw it actually really did help people. And um, yeah. I, I, think, I think Jamie said it right. It's a coping tool. You know, it gives you a little bit of space but you're also in it, you know, as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, uh, and that's kind of like being a photographer for us a, yeah. a lot of the time. Anyway, it's like, you're kind of in the scene, but sometimes you're a little bit of an observer of it. So it's like, you, there's a little bit of a voyeuristic kind of thing. I think sometimes in photography too. And so it's weird though, when you apply that to your own life, right. When you become the voyeur and then with her mother, like when we started doing it with her mother, that was a little bit different because, um, <laughs> we had to persuade her mother. She mm. was definitely not wanting to see herself yeah. in that condition. And she was worried about it getting published, which it did. But, but she, we have approval. But we, we asked her before we started pitching it and we showed her some of the stuff. And when she saw it, she understood why it could be helpful. And so she actually consented to be, having it being used because I think she also understood, like she didn't realize until she got sick that 
a lot of people when they have a stroke they're exhausted all the time and that that can be a permanent condition and like i don't know we didn't talk about that much but in our photo series you can see that her mother is exhausted she you know she's not sick she's literally exhausted because that's just a side effect sometimes of of a stroke the brain trying to recuperate is that you just have chronic exhaustion But again going back to um a woman's body and uh, the image of your own body as a woman uh, it was very interesting because my mom had similar reaction on the photos that I showed her and it was not it was a photo where she said that her neck looks like a turtle yeah. and uh, it was interesting that we both picked something about our bodies mm. And uh, in a really strange way. Her favorite way, image is the one with the lipstick. She so, loves the lipstick. Like there's an image where she's putting a lipstick on and she yeah. loves that image. Luckily, that was like the lead image when it got published. But like, so that image she was okay with. But there were some images that so, she was just so like. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to see how we are, as, as women, are shaped by our culture around us. Yeah. That always puts so much pressure on you have to look pretty. You have to look young. You yeah. have to be a... Uh, 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 sexy, you have to be an object, yeah. a beautiful object. And then when something bad happened to you, uh, you don't know how to cope with that. So you're going back to the, uh, uh, the patterns that you're used to and you're judging yourself again. So my mom loves the picture with the lipstick and I love the picture where I am starving myself on chemo. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So I, and speaking to that, when you started pitching it, right. Um, how, how did that, I mean, what was your selling point? What was your, you know, like I've got something here that is really special, you know, I mean, w- which has to be a difficult space, you know, because you're talking about yourself yeah. and your mom, your, your mother. I, I don't know that we, at first, I'm not sure we thought it was like necessary. We, we did portfolio reviews and CNN was one of the portfolio yeah. reviewers right. and, um, they were familiar with some of our other work, which was unrelated to this. And we, sh- I don't know, we just showed it to them on a whim, just like, hey, we're working on a project we haven't shown yet. Would love to get some feedback as we develop it. And sh- they were actually kind of on the spot interested. And then it took almost a year to get published, believe it or not. Like they were interested, then it went completely cold. Yeah. And then... Um, was, there something on, was there something in the world going on that put this to the exactly. back? Exactly. Yeah, well, war in Ukraine happened. Okay, well, okay, so it was that. I don't know if it was. I, I but mean, then, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I find that sometimes, like we've had that a lot, where people have told said yes to a story, it got greenlit, and then the, it never gets published. Like you know, we we've had we had a few last year like that. So I wasn't entirely. I didn't know that. I didn't really expect this to get picked up um, when it did, and then. Um, I remembered that they had kind of been interested. So I just circled back with them. I was like, hey, you know, caregivers month is this, you know, is in November. This was like May or something. I was like, would you guys be interested in doing something on this for caregivers month? And that, that was kind of like the spark that reignited it. Cause finally- I didn't even know there was a caregivers month. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so that's kind of like the, you know, that's just a little thing that we do often is yeah. we try to find the like little hooks. I used to work a lot in PR, so I kind of, I know some of these tricks is that, you know, basically all these outlets are really just looking for a well-timed story. Right. <laughs> they need content themselves. Yeah. yeah. They need content. If you can kind of help them think through a little bit um, how they could position your piece, um, that can go a long way. Right. But what uh, everybody felt um, um, very attracted to was that uh, feeling of the sandwich generation. Yeah. Because even the, the writer that was working with me um, and my mom, she was dealing with something similar with her mom. Mm. And as having uh, younger kids and uh, parents that are becoming more dependent, but they don't want to be dependent, which is completely understandable. But it's, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, I, you know that caregiver space is, is really an intense, an intense place to find yourself, and and being sick yourself is just, it's just impossible, right? I mean, to to write that that scenario. So wh- where do you guys go from here with the story? Uh, we are uh, for our own story. We are start. We are working on a book. 
we have so many more images we have writing yeah we were actually pretty far along on a book on our thing and then her mom got yeah. sick and i was like all right you know close the shop down we're, we're going to be busy for a while dealing with stuff so we actually stopped working on our project because her mom got sick and then um we're we're restarting now our own project i don't think that this work per se like when her mom got sick i'm not imagining we're going to include that in this but you know the good thing is we know who the, all the cast <laughs> so we can work on this really anytime we want yeah we don't have problems with the the permission i think we are planning yeah, to go my back releases to, right yeah we are fine we are planning to go back to czech republic this summer um where we would like to take some new photos out there because i think yeah. czech republic now is a really important in some ways part of the story because it's really it's where Ani is for Ani's original home. It's, it's her mother's when, home. We went there in the summer. I was in treatment, so it is important to me. And then just otherwise, we're just working. We're trying to do as much of our work related on these issues as we can. Because really, I think when Ani got sick, it was just redefined our purpose and mission for kind of what we value in life, what we think is important, and and the kinds of projects that we want to be working on. Um, I just don't think that there's really for us anything more important than the love between people, the love between family, and just how people can pick each other up. Uh, and frankly, I would think that was the first thing we did with you was like we were working on with volunteers in Brooklyn. Like we're just inspired by by people who give support to others in need. I think that that's something that is really needed and, yeah. in, and been in shorter supply in recent years and i think that we need to make a comeback with empathy yes, no, and compassion yeah. and support you're 100 right you know you, I, you guys know nancy borowick right yes yeah we do right like she's got a great book but you know what she does she speaks so nancy's just for people who don't know nancy both of her parents um got cancer and they both died within a calendar year and she did a book uh about that whole process but what she does she speaks to pharmaceutical companies right where she's going there and telling them thank you for all the research yeah because so many of those workers never get out you know they're in labs they're they're in they're in you know conference rooms and they don't know that all this great work keeps you know kept her parents alive longer saved other people's lives so she goes there as almost as an inspirational speaker mm -hmm. to pharmaceutical companies so that you know that could be something that you know of course you could see the see the application for you guys doing the same thing, you know, going maybe a little yeah. bit to the left or to the right, um, as, yeah. as far as giving back and saying thank you. Yeah, we'd we'd love to do more of that. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to go in um, September to Duke. We're going to give an exhibition and presentation on um, on, our work, on this project, on the, the, the mother, caregiving. the mother stuff with her right. mother. But uh, and, and how come Duke? They reached out. They saw the same really? enemies and they reached out. Great. Yeah. They, right. they have like a special specific caregiving division or something and they really wanted to focus on that but and uh, just, just let me put my rep hat on for a second <laughs> sure you're getting paid yes yes <laughs> okay. okay please yeah uh it's a, it's interesting to see um how much uh you realize when you're sick how much you need people around you and how you cannot do anything by yourself and it starts with uh obviously the doctors but everybody around you and how much people um influence each other so if you are not feeling well and somebody just smiles at you or mm -hmm. i don't know tells you um i just uh, read this book you know starts talking about something and you realize how much can that pick you up and help you out and uh how much we are actually depending on each other it's mm -hmm. sometimes scary when i see the people around you that i'm depending Definitely. on them but <laughs> no that, that <laughs> it's, yeah. it's true and yeah. uh that's i want that to be part of the the whole story too yeah we just hope we can open some conversations up about really difficult stuff but things i think most of us are going to be facing if we aren't already um and i think it's important to build community around that because you know we all need that support yeah yeah no you you you, you could not have um 
you could not have put it into a better context than 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 that. That is really it's perfect. And and if we all if we all do a little bit, you know, that's that's all it really takes is just, you know, like you said, Annie, you know, if hi, good morning, how are you? You know, means the world to somebody who's um who's not feeling well. It really um yeah, it really matters. It really, really matters. So um, you guys know you have a standing offer, and you know I want to be I want to be asked before you go to CNN. You know, when, as this story progresses, because we'd love to have you back. It, 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 it's a great story, and you guys are wonderful, wonderful presenters. Um, so you know that that is a, a standing offer. Um, you know, to, to come back. You know, once again, we would love to have you. But I, I'd like you guys to just close us out for the evening. Uh, but before that, if anyone else has any, I mean, you have to look in the chat room, guys. I mean, everyone is loving your story and, and all of that. If anyone has any um, any questions, you know, just, Jay, you can unmute everybody. And, you know, if anyone has a question, just raise your hand and, um, you, know, uh, you know, now now would be the time. But, you know, notwithstanding that, you know, you guys have the uh, the finishing statement. And then you know we'll let um, we'll let Howard find a way to dovetail this all together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Frank, you're the best. I, I mean, thank you for what you do yeah, for the community, uh, for inviting people to speak about work in this way. It's just so beautiful. And thank you, everyone, for showing up. I mean, it's like a seven seven thirty to eight thirty here in the East Coast, and I I know that this is. Maybe a little bit of a heavier a topic, topic for for the <laughs> before we go to bed. So I appreciate everyone kind of being here in studio. And, so, uh, uh, Mas, in. Um, we have a oh. question. How did you get on CNN? Was it just you, you had the portfolio review, you showed them the, the work, and then they jumped on it? Um, yeah. I wouldn't, yeah, I mean, we showed them the work. They were really interested. They then shared it with some producers who were also really interested. They asked us for a wider edit. Because I think we only showed them like 20 photos. So they wanted to see more. We sent them more. They were still really interested. And then it just kind of went cold. Um, and then I forget what happened. But I think, oh, you know, yeah, I can't remember exactly what happened. I think they selected one of our images for a oh, different. Oh, yes. For a, uh, it was selected for a competition. They were doing like a Mother's Day special. Yeah. And that's when we reached out and we're like, hey, I don't know if you remember, but we were talking about this project. Do you want to revisit it? Uh, Caregiving month is coming up in November. And that's when they were like, yes, let's let's. It was about timing and persistence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely persistence. Persistence is the, <laughs> the word. Yeah. Not yeah. like uh, we are not as lucky as hiking 17 miles. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not, right. not, not that lucky. kind of persistence. Not not that kind. Stop with the lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had our luck. I think day. Howard's more persistent than us, but yes. like. <laughs> no, it, that's uh, very true. Very, very true. Um, so, yeah. Howard, what do you got? Finish us off, Howard. Well, I, a very touching story. I, I'm actually helping care for uh, an aging mom who's 93. And I can tell you that the impact on my own life in terms of my ability to get out and travel and do the excursions into the wilderness is compromised by that, um, that there are both dignities and indignities tied up in caring for another human being. Uh, as a son, I never in, in, dreamed that I would see my mother unclothed um, or to have to help her into a commode uh, on all of those things. And, um, and then the emotional piece of it. So it was a very touching, tender, honest presentation of your work. And I'm really thankful that uh, you shared that. And I hope that people will pay attention to the story because there's a lot of lessons to be learned in that. Thank um, you. The parallel for me yes. um, is that I think that we all need places to escape. Um, and the camera in many ways is a play, is a, is a focusing tool, both as a double entendre and as a literal fact. Uh, it works that way for me. Um, it allows me to escape my own self, if you will. But at the same time, it allows me to emerge myself into an environment and sense it and be part of it on a level that is very different from someone who doesn't take the amount of time and focus that I do. So but good on you for the work you're doing. Uh, caregiving is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, stay with it. The reward in life uh, is 
worth every moment. Yeah. So something else I think I I can offer. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go on. Yes. Is that um, I, I come from a, a relatively large family. I'm the youngest of, uh, of the two million cousins or some ridiculous thing. So I've seen this too many times and just not uh, them, but uh, not just uh, family, but also, yeah, I, I wound up taking care of, I, well, I don't mean to gross anybody out, but I'm proud I, I got to change both my parents' diapers. But <laughs> I think that's something that happens when you're doing art at the same time as you're, uh, you're, 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 you're suffering. Um, it takes the weight off. It brings it back together. I think you, uh, we, anytime we're doing art, our brain is, uh, is working in ways that it doesn't work at other times. It's actually when doing art or doing that. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the, I, I can relate to what I hope, I hope uh, happened as a result of your producing these, uh, these works from, during these cancer uh, situations is that it gave you um, that peace. And the same thing, Howard, I mean, just go, going out there, coming, coming from New York, hey, I was born and relate, raised in Manhattan. I haven't left yet. <laughs> <laughs> I celebrated my 71st last week. Uh, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I'm, you, I, I, I have to guess that there's something very um, mentally uh, enriching from doing what you're doing. And thank you for showing it. Thank you. Yeah, very true. I, I tell you, I have cousins who live in Brooklyn. And uh, when I go, uh, we approach the city the same way we do a canyon <laughs> and photograph it from that perspective. There you go. All right. I do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to tell me that you climb the steps of the Empire State Building. You don't think I didn't. I took the elevator. But I did climb once to the top of uh, the Statue of Liberty when they used to let you do that. I don't know if they let you do it now. Yeah, I don't know. And I was fortunate enough to be in New York when the sun sets on the torch of the Statue of Liberty. Oh, wow. And I, I was at the Red Bank um, Pier thinking that I'd be the only photographer there. <laughs> and there must have been 50 people with lenses much bigger than mine. And um, it was a fabulous <laughs> moment. Wow. Okay, there you go. I, I haven't walked to the top of the Empire State Building, but I've been in the room at the very top, the portal to the, the dirigible that was built into the top, which I believe is still there. It was as, as of 10, 20 years ago when it was there. Little tiny room. You wouldn't believe what they expected people to do to get off the dirigible. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> um, yeah, well... I want to thank everyone once again for coming. Great stories, great inspirations. I, I really, um, e e you know, it feels like each presentation, th there's something that fills the heart and the soul um, w w with, uh, with good spirit. So I, I thank you all, Howard, Jordan, Anna, and everyone, you know, with your questions and your comments and, and you know, in the chat room is just spectacular. Everyone has a standing invitation to come back um you know we want you to come back you know, tell us more about your stories um and we'll see you next time you, you should know that in the middle of april we'll be doing another solid week on um the ukrainian issue you know we have uh journalists there who will be um will be showing us more and more work so that that's coming but again thank you very much um also i ask everyone if, if you haven't please subscribe to our youtube page if, if you get a minute that would be great um, so anyway, good night. Thank you again.